Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about torso finishing, the final paint finish, and then also we are going to be uh, creating and installing our chest buttons. So that's the goal we have for today's video, so let's jump into it. Alright, so we're getting, we're getting uh, there with the torso now. All the body work has been finished, so that took a couple weeks uh, back and forth, you know. Bondo, sanding, painting, testing, looking and everything and you know going through the whole process back and forth back and forth until I got all the main defects fixed and everything and then I coated it with this base coat of silver now this is the uh, shiny aluminum color that I'm using for the base coat and the reason I'm using it is two reasons one it fast it's super fast uh, drying uh, so you spray it on it's dry like in a minute and it has really heavy coverage uh, per can, so you're saving a lot of money. So that is that aluminum ultra coat from Rust-Oleum I'm using. But that's not the final coat because that doesn't look very good when you spray it on a textured surface because of the unevenness. But that's one of the reasons I'm using it. Because what it does is because it's so shiny, when you spray it on, it'll show you all the defects in the surface because the right light will reflect off all the different directions and you can tell which parts of the surface are rougher, smoother and which you need to do some work on before you do the final coat. So, and that won't be this color, it, it's a different color, it's a metallic, you know, that has metallic flakes in it and everything. So, this is just the sort of base color coat that I use. Uh, so, when you're doing a base color coat, use one that's super shiny and reflective and that will actually bring out all your defects you have in your surface so that you can correct them all before you do your final finish coat. So that's what we've done. We did that and we went through everything and we corrected everything and then we have our final sort of uh, base coat on here, which when it the light hits it, it reflects different ways and it looks you know, in some sections it looks rougher than others, right, because of the way it's reflecting. But again, that's because of the type of paint it is. When we put our final coat on of the color coat, which is a totally different paint, it's going to be more metallic and even. And then when we put our next final coat on, which is the flat clear coat, the matte clear coat enamel, that will then basically smooth everything out. Just like you saw on the tread sections and the waist and everything I showed you before. So it all, it all match, but it's a multi-step process to get through all this. So after I got done with this, then what I did is I masked off this area right here, covered the entire torso and covered the holes and everything from the inside. And then I sprayed the gunmetal color that goes here. So this is second, third season. If you're going to do that, if you're going to replicate the second or third season robot, this is where they did the refresh on them and he changed some colors on them. So this is that corresponding gunmetal, which is the same as the brain and the uh, radar section stripe and everything like that. And so what I did here is I masked it off just a little bit actually into the silver paint because what's going to happen here is once that's hardened and dried, I'm just going to mask off this area right here and then I can paint the rest of it in silver. If you do it the opposite way, it's much harder because if you painted the silver first and then had to go here, that means you have to mask off the entire uh, torso. And there's a good chance by, you know, some hole or something paint is going to get through and then you're going to ruin your silver finish. So my suggestion is to paint this portion first because it's going to be easier just to do a very flat masking on this to cover it and then everything else just gets painted silver over it. But even, even when I left it a little bit right here, as you can see on the, uh, the lines right here, they're super clean. So even this way, right, even though it's a little bit into the silver here, it actually looks great. Like I, I would leave it like that if that was, if that silver was the final coat. Of course it's not, but, um, so that's, that's just a, just a little hint there that you can do on that. One of the other reasons I did it this way is because the paint I'm using on the final coat is a, t is a paint that is just, it's really hard to work with and it takes months and months to really fully cure hardened 
um, you really can't touch it for a, a quite a long time, even after it seems like it's dry to the touch. Um, cause if you press on it or anything, it'll put a fingerprint in it. It's, it's just a very weird paint that I picked and it wasn't my, you know, I didn't realize I was going to have this kind of problem with it, but I'm stuck with it at this point for the silver. So we talked about that in the other video for the paints and, uh, I wouldn't recommend this particular top coat I'm using, but now at, at this point I'm locked into it, so I have to finish out with it. But luckily this is the last piece that's gonna get painted in that, so. Yeah, so I just finished this. It's got a clear coat on it also, just uh, to seal it off. And I'm gonna let that dry uh, until next weekend. And then next weekend, hopefully, if we get a good day, we'll be able to do our final color coat. So I need two really, really good days left here in uh, the fall, because we're, we're coming to the middle of September here. Weather's turning, you know, it's getting windier, so you can't paint in the wind. It's very hard uh, to paint in the wind, obviously. Um, and I need a good day that's around, you know, 70, 76 to like 85, somewhere in that range, right? So I need a warm sunny day with no wind. So we'll see if we're gonna make it because uh, we're getting to the point of fall now that uh, those days are getting farther and few between. And um, you know, they have to fall on a weekend obviously. So, so that's our next step. So we're almost there. And once we get this painted and sealed, we can just let it sit for a couple weeks and then we're really ready to start going to town uh, putting stuff in the torso so it's really going to come alive at that point so but that's where we are right now with the painting it, this is a long sort of process if you rush it uh, you're going to get a poor finish and you don't want that after all the time you spent on it so just take your time with it and uh, and uh, hopefully I'll be back uh, with another video showing you the final uh, finish all right guys, so we uh, we did make our uh, goal here, which is to get the torso uh, completely finished as far as all the bodywork and painting. Took a lot of work. It was like uh, four, four, six weeks, I think it was. Back and forth, lots of painting. It's, you know, when you're painting obviously outside, you've got bugs you have to worry about falling into the paint and uh, dust and, you know, then you gotta sand it out, redo it again. It's a whole big deal, right? And you can see I have the uh, front here also for the gunmetal uh, painted. So it turned out really well. It's got that nice, very light texture on it that makes it look sort of like cast aluminum. And uh, yeah, uh, all the seams are nice and clean and everything's been uh, finished really well. I drilled out the hole for the microphone here. I've got the hole over here, which is going to be the volume control. And... Uh, I got the torso hooks on at the top here, as you can see. So I made sure those were uh, on there before I did the final finish coats and stuff. So yeah, it turned out uh, pretty uh, pretty good. So pretty happy with it and it's gonna be ready now for build work. Uh, but we're gonna let it dry a good two weeks. Really let the paint harden up. Cause as I told you in an earlier video, the, finished color coat that I'm using is uh, takes a long time to dry, like really dry. So like if I ran my fingernail across here right there, I could put a, I could put a scratch in it right now because the paint is really, even though it's dry to the touch, right? It's soft as far as any kind of pressure or anything like that because it takes a long time. So it's gonna sit here on its little pedestal and uh, dry for about two weeks before we start doing um, you know, additional work, which will be the vent system on the bottom next. But that's where we are with the torso. So luckily, uh, we don't have to wait till next spring. So we got it done, and now uh, that means I can work on this during the winter. You know, to to uh, get all the internal components put in. So here are the chest buttons that go into the chest plate, right? And you can make these either static or you can actually make them operational. So we're gonna try to make them operational, but the first thing we have to do is get the buttons painted. So they come in these sets with the letters and the numbers engraved in the 
acrylic pieces. So these are just little rectangular ac acrylic pieces that fit in the frame. They're made by Craig, one of our club members. So he makes these now that you see at the top here, these clear ones. Uh, these colored ones down here were the original set that they used to make. Okay, so I have actually the two different variations. And so what you do is, there's a video out on the B9 Robot Builders Club on how to paint these letters in here, but it's super easy and you cannot mess it up. So don't be scared to try it because it's just incredibly easy to do. Since the letters are engraved inside the acrylic already, you're just gonna take a latex uh, paint. So just go to Michaels or somebody and just get a latex paint. This is a latex acrylic right here. And all you're gonna do is take a brush and just paint over the letters to fill them in. And it's okay if you get it all over the surface, don't even worry about it. So you're gonna paint the letters to fill it in. And again, this is on a, a video out there on the B9 Robot Builders Club. Dave Shupias did one on this. So, And um, once you fill it in, you just let it dry about three minutes or so. And then all you're gonna do is take a flat piece of plastic, like a credit card or something, something's completely flat, and wrap a paper towel around it and just dab it with your finger just to make it a little bit moist. Not much, just very little. And then you're just gonna wipe this right over it and it's what it's gonna do is wipe the paint right off the surface and leave the paint inside the letters. And here's the thing, if you're gonna frost them like I did here and not leave them shiny clear, then what you, you don't even have to worry about getting it all off. You just get most of it off, right? And so what'll happen then is you let it dry and then you look at it and basically see, did I fill in all the letters? Is there any spot missing? If there's any spot missing, just take a little paint and dab it right in that letter. You don't even have to do the whole thing again. And then again, wait a couple minutes and then wipe it off to get the surface pretty much. So you're, you'll end up with just basically black streaks on the surface, okay? Then you wanna set those aside, let them dry for about 15 minutes. Uh, so that the black really dries nice and hard, okay? Because it doesn't take this long to dry. Then what you're gonna do is take a piece of 400 grit sandpaper, lay it on a very hard surface like you see here in my workbench, but something very hard and flat. And then you're gonna just flip over the front face and just sand it on the sandpaper in circular motion, okay? And what'll happen is it'll sort of fog the front and make it like a frosted look, okay? But also what'll happen is it will leave the letters alone and any little black that you had on the surface will be wiped right off when you do that, okay? You could do it the other way, like in Dave's video, he shows how going over it a couple times with, with a, a wet, flat, uh, cloth, right, will clean it off, but you don't even have to go that far. As long as you get the main part off and just minor streaks, that's gonna come right off with the sanding. And if you're gonna do the um, frosted look. Now, if you're not gonna do the frosted look, then of course, then you do have to clean it off, okay? And then what you wanna do is take that and hold it up to a light. Now I have Craig's light box here, which has an LED, and I just held it up to it. And what that does is it shows you if you missed any black in any of the letters, because it's hard to see. Once you've got the sanding done and everything, you basically just blow it off with a little air. And then I take a soft, dry brush, and I just brush out all the letters to make sure there's nothing in them. Because sometimes it'll look like it's missing a little bit, but it's just a little white grit left over from the sanding. And once you have them all cleaned up and everything, then I do one extra step that they didn't do in the video, which is I'm gonna do a crystal clear coat on this. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna bring out this black. It's really gonna make the black pop on this and give it a nice coat on the surface so that when you're touching it with your fingers, if you are gonna make them active buttons, you won't wear out the, uh, your oil from your hands won't get into the letters and then wear them out over time, okay? Now you can see like on the clear ones, when you use black paint, right, it stands out when they're not lighted. And then when they are lighted, it pops even more, because remember, these will have a colored background behind them to make them the color they're supposed to be. So there's three colors. There's like a amber color, red, and a green. On the original ones, you can see they were actually 
colored that color, the amber, red, and the green colors, uh, the acrylic was actually that color. The problem is if you do it this way, a lot of guys will do white instead of black because when they're not lit, you can't really see the letters as well, right? So, but when we do the um, clear coat on it, that will help that bring that out a little bit, okay? But if you like uh, them to be very visible when it's not lit and the robot's not on, then you, you uh, can do them white like on the first season. Now, when you do them white, the problem is when it does light up, then they're not quite as visible because then the white is being sort of washed out by the light behind it. Whereas these, when they light up, will pop because there'll be this great color and then you'll actually see the black too. So again, if you hold them up against a light source before you do any, before you finish them off, you're gonna kind of be able to see how they're gonna look when they're lit up. So uh, the reason I didn't go through all this in the video is because Dave has it out on the B9 uh, Robot Builders Club. There's a video out there already to how to do this. I just do that little extra phase where I'm going to be doing a, a crystal clear coat on top of these just to protect them basically and then um, the black will then kind of pop a little bit more on these clear ones too. So all I did is I took some painters tape, rolled it around to make it a double sided and I stuck these all on this board and all I'm going to do is very, not heavy either, it's just going to be light coat of crystal clear. Um, and I'm using this Rust-Oleum matte clear enamel that I've been using on the rest of the robot. And that's going to finish out these buttons. And then once that is done, because some of the clear may get on the sides right here, on the sides of the buttons and everything, once that's finished and I let them dry a day, what I'm going to do is then just sand down the edges, of the sides. Um, they're still going to stay this nice sharp rectangular square but I'm just gonna make sure there's nothing on the uh, side so that they push in and out from the uh, frame that they'll fit into easily and then the next step will be to get the backings on these so the backings are these little pieces that are just a little bit bigger it's a rectangular piece just a little bit bigger than the actual button itself that you glue on the back and that's what makes it so it doesn't pop out of the frame like it's like the holder basically and for the clear ones, you have to make sure you get the right color behind them, unlike these, which are just all the same color behind them, which is just a, basically a, a white backing. These actually have different colors depending on the button, so make sure before you glue them on, you know which color goes with which button so you don't make a mistake, okay? And that's pretty much it. So our next step is just to get these clear coated, and then once we have that, we can clean them up on the edges and then go ahead and put the backings on and you'll kind of see what those look like. So we've got our buttons clear coated now um, and so and we have our two sets. We've got our colored set and our clear set so we're going to do both sets but the next step is actually to uh, assemble the buttons and what I mean by that is there's a button and then there's a backing plate that goes over it. And if you look at it, if I put this button on the backing plate, you can see it just has a very small border around it. And all that's for is so that when it goes into the actual frame, and you put the button here, right, and it actually goes into the frame, it prevents the button from falling out, right? Because the little backing plate is just a little bit bigger than the button, and that's what holds it, right, from falling out in the front. And if you're just using static buttons, then you need to do that so that they don't fall out, right? Because it's going to be attached to that. Um, otherwise, there's no way the button could you know, be attached to the frame. If you're using active buttons, then there's going to be another button behind here that you're going to push on that's going to make this go in and out, right? But either way, you have to assemble these buttons. So on the colored acrylic ones, they just have these opaque or clear um, pieces of flat acrylic that you're going to mount these on. Um, on the colored buttons, or excuse me, the clear buttons, right, those go on to a piece of colored acrylic, so opposite, right? So we're going to start with these here, and basically what we're going to be using is Gorilla Tape. 
So this is crystal clear Gorilla double-sided tape. This stuff is stu super sticky. And what we're going to be doing is applying it first to the button and then trimming around the edge. And then we're basically gonna kind of stick it on the backing plate, centering it the best we can, and then really pressing down on it to try to make sure there's no bubbles in it, okay? Um, so that's the key. You don't want to see any bubbles when you're looking through it. However, before you do that, what you want to do is take your uh, button and then hold it up to a light source so you can check it first. So I'm going to like show you in a second. I'm going to just turn on this light source we have right here. Let me push this stuff out of the way here. All right. And what you want to do is hold your button in front of the light source. And the reason you want to do that is so you can see if there's any nicks on the back edge. So if there's any nick on the back edge, like this one has just a tiny one right, right there, what happens is when it comes through on the light, it actually looks like a little, it actually looks like a, a black spot. Uh, and it's just because of the way the light reflects on that chip. So because these are made out of acrylic, there's a chance that some of the edges could be chipped. And if they are chipped, what you want to do is first sand those down on the back edge. Doesn't You don't want to touch the front edge because you want that nice and crisp sharp. But on the back edge, it doesn't really matter as much. So that you're going to take a little sandpaper and sand out that chip. And when you sand out the chip, then the little mark sort of disappears so you don't really see it. The other thing you're checking for is, do you have any paint or anything that got on the back edge? Because that will also show through if it's on there. So this has a little actually black paint on it right here, which I can see it when I'm looking through on the light, right? So you're gonna wanna use a light source, right? And just check them. Now, if you accidentally scratched the back of the smooth portion of it, what you can do is get some wet, uh, fine sandpaper. I actually have some plastic polish that could polish that right out back to its clear shininess, right? If you scratched any of the back. Because if you scratch the back, that will also show through almost like a mark or a paint piece. So first thing you got to do is go through each piece and make sure they're okay before you do this, this tape part, right? And then once you've done that, then you're okay to proceed forward. Okay, but if you don't do that first, then uh, you may find that, you know, you're missing something. Okay, so you got to check them all first, make sure they're okay. And, and of course, if you did anything along the lines where there's something, I can see on the back of this one, it's actually, looks like it's uh, scuffed a little bit or scratched. So I need to polish that out on the back of this one because it sort of shows through a little bit. Not much, but it does show through a little bit, so... You want to check all your buttons before you do this final phase is what my point is. But once you get to your your buttons are okay, you're satisfied with them, then you're ready to mount them onto your little backing plates. And again, you're just going to use the glue. Now make sure your backing plates also are clean because that's going to affect your final, the way the tape you know, lays on them and stuff like that. So this one I can see there's a little actually goo or tape on it, right? So I've got to clean that off. So that's what you want to do, and that's how you assemble your buttons. All right, guys, so one of the chest buttons is completed here, and so you can see the uh, this is the vector hold one. It's the amber one. And you can see I have it attached to a functional switch. So it's a push-button switch because I'm making all mine that are going to be the chest buttons, you know, that go in the chest plate functional so I can do something with them. So. They're going to fit in here, as you can see, and you can see when you look at it from the back here, the white plate, right, is what prevents it from pushing through the front. But let's say this was mounted just like it is right here, right? All that's going to happen is I'll be able to just push on it, right? And it will, you know, do a function, whatever it may be. So how am I creating these? So what I did, there's a couple things you have to do here. So, um... On the B9 Builders site, they talk about using Gorilla uh, glue, double-sided clear tape. 
I don't like that stuff. And the reason I don't like it is because the backing is too hard to get off of it without ruining the tape. So the key to this whole thing is when this is lit up. So actually, let me light this up so you can see it. But because these are lit switches, these are LEDs, right? So uh, the key to this is that so you don't see any edges when you're looking at the button itself, right? Is the fact that uh, the tape is applied evenly all to the edge, right out to the edge of the button. You know, no air bubbles underneath it and it's not jagged or anything because then you would see it sort of through the, the buttons, right? Now these are the older style buttons that were, um, actually the buttons itself were actually colored and then it has an opaque uh, backing plate. The newer ones that Craig sells are actually the opposite. They're clear buttons with a colored backing plate, right? And that makes it even worse as far as seeing the defects in the tape. So it's super important that the tape is completely smooth on the back of the button and there's no bubbles or anything and the edges are smooth. Now the edges are very hard to cut. I tried using a you know, a knife and very sharp brand new blade it still like yanks and pulls on it. So the best way is to take a very sharp scissors. And if you do that and just, you know, cut the tape right down the side of the button, it should come off in one swoop without any problem. So that's, that's the uh, thing. Now I am using a clear tape, but this is a clear tape that I got on Amazon, which is basically the same thing as a Gorilla tape. Only it's a little more forgiving and you can take it off if you screw it up and then do a new piece. Um, but it is super sticky, just like the Gorilla Tape. But first of all, it's in a nice width so it doesn't have that big thick width of the Gorilla Tape. And you're not wasting as much. But two, the backing on this comes right off. It's so easy to get the backing off of this when you want to do the other side. The Gorilla Tape, it's impossible to get the backing off. It's almost like the backing is stuck to the tape and you destroy like the whole corner trying to get the backing off and that's the problem with the Gorilla Tape. So anyway, so when it's all said and done, then it'll be a lighted button, right, that you can actually push on and um, use. Now, by default, you have the backing plate, the button goes through it, right, and then we're gonna have to create some kind of another plate back here that is sandwiched, you know, we're gonna have to put some supports or something, right, where the actual button is gonna be mounted into, right? So I have an idea on that, but the first thing we gotta do is get all these buttons made. So now that they've all been painted and everything, and I just need to assemble them. So it's as simple as uh, putting a piece of double-sided clear tape on the back of the button, trimming around it, and then all we're gonna do is center it. So pretend like this button has tape on the back of it. We're gonna center it on the backing plate and it doesn't have to be perfect because the backing plate is just used so it doesn't come through the front of the trim plate. Uh, but just get it as close to centered as possible on the backing plate. And then you're just gonna repeat that step on the back of the backing plate to the top of the button. Now, I got these buttons on Amazon also. They're just lighted and I'm using white ones because in my particular case, they're clear, but you can also get colored ones, okay? That would match if you're doing the other ones with the clear buttons, and this will actually give you a brighter color if you do that behind this, okay? So depending which button set you have, you can use clear or, uh, excuse me, the white ones or the colored buttons. But you do have to do one modification to them because they won't work as is. So the problem with the buttons, if you look at the one that I've made right here, you can see along the edge here, there's nothing. There's no nothing sticking up there and I can push the button down, right? Because this plate is wider than the button, okay? However, when they come out of the package, the way they look is like this. They actually have this little side that sticks up here. So what you have to do is you have to cut this off so this doesn't exist, so that when you push down on the the main button, right, that backing plate can push down to here. So what, what you can do with these is they do actually pop off, right? These actually pop right out if you pull them. It has just little sort of like, um, you know, little pins sticking out that pop off. And once you pop them off, you can just take your scissors and right along the top edge, 
just cut it right off. Just cut that just sort of lip right off there. And you can see I cut it right off. And you can just do that quickly on both sides. It's pretty simple because your, your scissors will line up against the edge of the button. And then you can see now I cut that off. Now I can put the button back in there. You just pop it back on, snaps in. Okay. And now when I put my plate on, as you can see, so pretend there's a, uh, you know, there's a piece of tape in between there. Now you can see the plate doesn't hit the black housing part of it, right? The button's all the way down and there's still a little bit of a gap there where it clears it. So you just have to snap off those two edges and uh, then you can fix it. So, and they do come right off, right? The button pops out um, and they'll, they'll cut right off. You can actually use a pliers and just bend them. They snap off too. So either way, but you do have to do that little modification to these switches. And then um, these are just 16 millimeters lighted momentary switches on Amazon. It was nine bucks for a pack of five. So I just needed two packs of the white ones. So 20 bucks and I've got all 10 buttons. Now that we have our, our uh, functional buttons kind of made now, so we have to give them a mount them. So this is the front plate that goes on the front of the robot, right, in the chest area. And so the button obviously comes through there. You can see it just sits in there now because it has a little backing plate on it so it doesn't go through. But we, we want to mount it someplace so that you'd be able to push on it and actually do something with it. So there's this plate um, and sort of like this light box that goes behind it. Now normally these buttons are just static. They're just display and they're lighted. So the little diffuser plate goes here and then the buttons are sandwiched between here you know, and it lights them up from behind and that's pretty much it. We're going to use this a different way though. So we're going to use this plate but what I've done here is I've taken the the main frame and I just outlined all the rectangles and then I just went corner to corner to crisscross them to end up with the center point of each rectangle. So we're going to use this plate here somehow. I'm not sure how yet, but this is the plate we're going to use to mount the buttons. And the reason we want to use this is because it is curved just like the curve of the face plate. That means the buttons are going to be, you know, at the right angle because if I use a flat plate, right, they're not going to be, and I tighten them down, you know, instead of being, you know, here, they could be like cockeyed, right? So you need to have some kind of mounting plate that is the same curve as the face plate. And that's what this does. So this works out really well. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill a hole in all these rectangles here. And again, you don't really see this, this part right here, but I'm going to make the holes. Obviously, they have to be as big as the diameter here of this, right? So it can slide through, but I'm going to make it bigger because I need to be able to move these around a little bit, sort of left, right, up and down because, you know, when you're putting, when you're doing the double sided tape and everything, it's not exactly centered 100% across the whole thing on the center line basically of the switch itself. So it has to be adjustable so I can move it around and it fits you know, squarely in the frame, but it's not too far left or right or up or down, then I can't push the button or it gets jammed in there. So I need slack basically is what I'm saying. And uh, until I find out exactly where it's going to be. So we're gonna make a hole and we're, we're gonna make it bigger. Now luckily, the way the buttons are made here, um, even though you're drilling the hole, you have this big rectangle right that goes around it so I should be able to move it where I want to I could always use a washer or something too if I needed to uh, if to make sure it doesn't fall through the hole or something like that but whatever the situation is we'll figure out okay and our main goal is to get these mounted in this plate right here and then what once we get this all drilled we can clean all this ink off right here and then um, mount them all in there line them up with the face plate to make sure they're all good and then from that point forward if say we mounted them in the light box here we would need some kind of a distance between the plate and the mounting so that the button can actually push down which is just a small amount it's probably only a quarter inch but still I'm gonna need something in between there right to space it out so we've got some I'm not sure exactly how we're gonna do it yet we're gonna figure it out but our first step is to get this plate drilled 
and then we're gonna make sure the holes are bigger because once we drill the holes, it's very hard to drill a bigger hole, right? So we're gonna drill the holes, which are gonna take up most of the rectangle, to be honest with you, but um, we'll get those all drilled. And then what we'll do is we'll put all these in here and just hand tighten them just to get them close. Then we'll put the grill on and we'll line it all up and make sure everything works and everything clears and you can push on the buttons correctly. Uh, then at that point we're ready to come up with whatever the next step is to get the distance between the two. Alright guys, so my plan here uh, to actually, uh, you know, drill holes through this backing plate, which was, this is actually made out of acrylic. Um, you can see it went, didn't go very well. I was just trying to drill a little pilot hole through here and it just snapped right off. Because this is hard plastic acrylic, so this, this is not forgiving to any kind of uh, cracking or anything like that. So this is the piece that actually came with the older kit with the colored buttons, okay? But Craig's new kit actually comes with a piece of plexiglass, which is what I used here on the back, right? So you can see it right here. And so I did the same thing though, right? I basically made a center point uh, on the plexiglass, as you can see right here with all the switches mounted in it right here. This is a three quarter inch hole I used with a hole saw. So I got a DeWalt little hole saw uh, and I drilled a three quart. Now what I did first though, to prevent this from cracking and breaking, because even though it's flex, it's a little more flexible and forgiving, plexiglass is still a hard plastic, right? So what I did is I took the, uh, so if you know a hole saw basically is, has the, the main bit and then it's got a, it's basically got a bit, like a one eighth bit coming through the center of it and that's how you start it, right? You start that on your point, it drills through that, and then the rest of the hole saw takes over. So what I did is I took my uh, drill bit that's in the hole saw, right, and I just manually drilled the holes through the plexiglass. So, and it takes very little pressure. Um, and you just turn it, you know, I used the drill, it was in the drill, but I just turned it and it grabs the uh, plexiglass and it just cut right through it and I just did it very slowly to get the main hole in for the bit because that's the piece that is going to split the plexiglass if it's any piece. It's not going to be the hole saw the because the hole saw has all those teeth going around it that just grind right through the uh, the plexiglass, right? So I did that manually in all 10 holes, took a while and then once I had those holes then I just put the hole you know, hole saw bit, the center bit right through there, and then just very slowly on incredibly low speed, just drill through the plexiglass until it, it came through. And it's sort of nice because it's sort of, uh, it melts a tiny bit at the same time it's drilling, so it's really nice and it doesn't crack. So, and I made it through 10 holes, so you can see that it does work if you do it uh, nice and slow and take your time. But the key is to get that pilot hole drilled first and do it manually, not with a power tool. Okay, so then you can see what happens here is all that all I did is I put the switches in here and with their little square uh, kind of washers on the back here, the holes are bigger than the switches so that they can move around left and right, up and down, right? And so they're, you know, basically when they're in here then you can see just pushes in and out, really nice. Now the end ones here are a little tight, but remember when this gets pinched down, this is going to curve up a little bit, so it's not quite in the position yet. And I can always take a little Dremel tool and grind out one of the sides to make it be able to, so these little outer switches move in a little better, right? They're not bad, but one of these, like this one, sticks a little bit down here because it's not exactly centered, right? So, but I'm not going to worry about that right now because our next step is actually to get this plate here mounted on the torso. So this is what I think I'm going to do because we have to basically what has to happen is here is we can't just leave this hanging right here. It's got to be attached to something, right? So what we're going to do is the front plate here goes on the front of the torso and a screw goes through there. We're going to use threaded studs on the back here uh, to hold that plate on the front. 
And then, kind of like standoffs, little standoffs they use on like computer boards and stuff like that. And then on the other side of the standoff, it'll either have a thread, a male thread, or it'll be female threaded, either or. And then we'll push, you know, fasten this piece to that stud that's sticking out there. So in other words, the plate goes through the front of the torso, the screw goes through there and screws into a brass stud. And then that gets tightened down so the plate is now fastened to the front of the torso and it can't move around. Now that we have this stud sticking out here that's going to be on this side, it that'll be threaded also so that I can screw from behind and then attach this to that. And I can use washers to get it the way I want to, right, so that if I need to make it go, you know, flex a little bit because there is some flex, right, and tighten it up. You know, so it's going to be a, a lot of finicky work to get it done, but it should work because all these middle buttons right here pretty much work pretty much the way they are. You know, this one sticks a little bit right here, but again, it's all going to be because it's lined up. Now, on the back here where the switches are, you don't really have to tighten these things down, like crank them down because that that is just going to make it so that it goes at a certain angle and might hang up, right? You can just basically tight finger tight just enough to hold just to, so it doesn't come loose right that's all you need and they don't have to be because they're not going to go anywhere remember this is going to be mounted to the torso you'll have a stud in between here so these two plates will be solid these switches could actually just float a little bit inside here that way if they move around or anything like that they can always be free and they'll never stick so that's our plan, but uh, I'm waiting for some pieces to come in. I had to order the studs and everything. And as you can see on the end here, these little white plates that are on these two last switches on the end, they're going to be a problem because they're going to interfere with the, st with the little uh, mounting stud. So I'm probably going to have to cut the corners off of those, to be honest with you. Um, but that's all right. We'll have to play with it until we get it to the way we need it, but we'll see. Um, we'll see what, you know, how much room we have once we get to that point. So, but that's pretty good. This is a nice solid unit. I wish you could just slide it in like this, right? But you can't, unfortunately, because, um, if I did that, there'd be nothing to hold this plate in the back and they're just going to fall out. So, but anyway, it looks pretty good the way it is. These are all backlit with LEDs. Now, when we get to the wiring portion of this, what we're going to do is there are two terminals on each one for the LED powers. And we're just all we're going to do is connect them all together. So in other words, all the pluses get connected together, all the minuses connect together right in between. And then there'll just be a pair of wires coming off to power the LED lighting. Each switch, however, needs two wires coming off of it, right? So that's 20 wires coming out of here. It's a lot. Um, but they're just triggering, triggering small little tiny voltages. So we're going to use like, I don't know, maybe 30 gauge or something. Something really tiny and flexible, right, for these. But they're all going to come out off of these. And you notice there's three terminals on these. And that's because one is the ground and one is normally open. One is normally closed. So obviously we want them to be normally open and then when you push the button it closes it. So you got to make sure, don't forget, when you're doing all this you're on the right terminal. And one thing I forgot when I was putting these in, and I was, remember when I was making the buttons and I was popping that little white um, lens off, I forgot to line it up when I put it back together. So do you see how some of these, there's, see that little sort of like rectangle line here, see how they match? They match, but these are backwards. See that? And you can see because they're the terminals are on the opposite side. So when I wire this up, it's too late now because I'm not tearing apart the switches, right? But when I wire these up, I just have to make sure I'm on the right terminal. So just a little hint when you're making your switches way back like before and you're putting them back together, make sure everything lines up so you don't have to do the hassle like I'm going to have to do, which is... I'm gonna to have to make sure that each one is wired correctly and crisscross them because of the, that uh, I wasn't paying attention there. So that's pretty much it. 
Okay, so what I'm doing to create the space between the front plate and the supporting plate for the switches is I'm using these little uh, brass spacer standoff screws. And so this little kit I got from Amazon for like nine bucks. And it comes with different lengths of these spacers and it comes with two, two types. Uh, one that has female threads on both ends and then one that has female on one end and male on the other. And so you can join these together by taking one of these with that has the male end and then taking one with a double female and screwing them together and basically make any length you want that you're going to need. So now in my particular case I use the 10 millimeter uh, ones right here and that was enough and that's, I, I think I did, actually, I think I did 10 and, uh, what did I do? 10 and then the 6, maybe. But anyway, you're going to make it out of the length you want. And then, basically, on the front, I have the screw going in the front of the body, right through the face plate, and then screws into the stand. And let me show you what it looks like on the robot. So there's the robot's, you know, uh, screws right in the front here, right on the two sides. And this is now in here solid because on the back here, I have the two, as you can see, if I just zoom in right there, the little stand sticking out there. And it's actually really strong, believe it or not, uh, because the thickness of the fiberglass and everything. So they're now permanently mounted. And so now I can deal with the buttons and getting them lined up in here correctly because I don't have to worry about dealing with the front here with this plate banging around and then scratching all the paint and everything so suggestion is to get this mounted first then uh, you can mount your buttons and the plate on the back here and adjust everything as needed now the, the buttons that are on the ends of the panel which are the orange or the amber ones you're going to need to make sure that on the one side, basically the left side of the button right here, it's flush. So unlike the other buttons, you know, where you have sort of the backing, you know, this little backing, this opaque backing sort of sticks out beyond the button a little bit. And remember that was originally made that way so that the buttons would stay in the panel if you were just doing um, non uh, functional buttons right and it's just for display and lighted but because we're using functional we have to be able to clear a few things and remember that little stud that's sticking out the side there in the middle that holds the plankton and everything that is going to be in the way here so that's why these end ones you have to cut flush okay so you may want to make sure you do that I had to do it after the fact so I had to take the buttons apart to redo it again obviously and so that's something just to keep in mind because uh, you need the clearance and then also you have to make sure that on the robot itself your opening is wide enough right so that even it's below the clearance you know when the buttons come through that little bit that you have hanging off the bottom with that white opaque stuff clears the body on the inside so it's a tight squeeze because you don't have a lot of room between the body and the plate, right? You only got this little space here and you can't cut it too wide or you're gonna get a gap down at the bottom here. So it's a, you know, it's a very precise kind of fit type of thing. So you take your time and be slow. So the next step after you get everything kind of situated is you gotta wire it up and you have to get this wired up before because there is a ton of wiring on here. So first thing we have is the wiring for the lighting of the LEDs that are in the switches. So those just get constant power. So all I did is I have two leads coming in here and I'm just jumping from each one to each one going around the um, circle right here and that's it you do and you just have to make sure because you might like I said before my switches were some were one direction some were the other so you just have to make sure the reds are on the same terminals and the blacks are on the same terminals. These particular switches are not uh, polar specific, so it doesn't matter which side is hot and which side is ground, but um, just pick one of the terminals on each side. They're sort of separated by a line right here, so you can see which ones are which. And make sure that if you have a switch switched around the other way, that you uh, make sure you're on the right terminal. And I just jumped them all and then soldered them on those terminals. And so now, let's uh, turn over here, just for now and we'll 
turn on the power and you can see they're all lit up and they look really good actually um, so really happy with that um, that they're all lit up like that so <clears throat> that works out really well so now before we can do our final mounting we still have to put all the wires on for each individual push button so there's going to be two wires per right so that's 20 wires have to come off here yet on top of this and there are basically three terminals to choose from on the switch itself so you're going to have one of the terminals and they're all marked you have to look closely but one of the terminals is going to be the ground wire and then you got two hots and it's either normally open or normally closed and you're going to pick which one you want so for us we're going to pick normally open for everything because we don't want them closed we want them to trigger something when we push it so they're all going to be normally open so I'm just going to pick those two and again these all have to be separate because they're separate switches so that means 20 wires coming off of here um, that we have to put on here now what we're going to do is we're going to just make them <clears throat> sort of like I don't know maybe a foot long or something like that uh, for each pair and then we'll put a connector at the end of it to then connect it to another you know part when we get to that part of the robot but we just need some good sized leads coming out of the uh, the uh, switches and so that's what we got to do next and you got to get these all done because there's no way you're going to be able to do this once this is mounted inside the robot all right so you can see the uh, pl finished plate here with the buttons in it right and they're all functional when you push on them right that one's sticking a little bit so we got to adjust it but okay but basically the way it works is um, if you look down here you can kind of see there's this uh, sort of plexiglass plate right here that curves along with it that the switches are mounted into and what I've done is the screws that are coming on the side there that hold on the plate, I've used these little sort of um, PC board mounting studs to take up the space to the plexiglass plate. And then that's what holds the switches at the right distance from the front of the main trim plate. Okay, kind of just works like that. And so these switches actually can be a little bit loose in here so they can sort of move around and have play. Um, the big thing with this is to try to make sure that the all the edge is clear on the inside with those little extra plates that are on the back of the um, buttons, right? Those little wider opaque plates. Because they'll hang up either on the body opening if it's not wide enough or on the edges here it's tricky because there's this screw in the middle here and that corner wants to stick out and hit it so you have to shave it off so it's you know it gets a little tricky with some of these uh, so what you have to do is get them in there make sure you have everything like the distance between the front and the supporting plate set then you got to play with it each individual one once you get that set so I've got them in a pretty good spot right now but in order to put this in its final position, I need to clean these up. So I'm going to take it off, go through each button, make sure the edges are nice and clean now because they've got junk uh, stuck on the sides of the tape. And when they're lit up, you can kind of see it on the edges. So get these all cleaned up. Once they're all cleaned up, then what we'll do is um, get ready to put in the final position. And then um, what you do is on the back of the plate, the, the clear plexiglass, you just elongate the holes left and right, up or down, so you have some slack to move the button around inside the frame. And once you get them in the right position, then you can just snug down the little um, nuts on the back of the switches. They don't have to be super tight because they're not moving or going anywhere. They just snug them down a little. The other thing that you can do also is this curvature of this plate has to be the same curvature as the front because the buttons have to come out at the right angle so they're coming basically out straight and not at an angle this way or that way and that backing plate controls that so if the curve is not right if it's too steep like too sharp or too uh, soft basically you can use little washers on the ends where those posts are and then either bring it out or in to make it either less curve 
or sharper curve, you know, depending what you need to make these. It's really the two end ones that are the problematic ones. These, these are the ones that are going to be the issues because they're at a very sharp curve at this, at, when you get to that point. These are not so bad in the middle because they're just straight coming through the uh, plate here. So, but you can see for the most part, I got them working right. So this one's sticking a little bit right here, you know. So we have to make sure, and the, I can see by the angle, it's just not at the right angle here. So, and then this one's okay. I think this one sticks a little bit right here sometimes. So I think the edge is uh, sticking. So we got to just, you know, go through it, but you got to be very careful because if you nick the edges too much, then you're going to see it when they're lit up. It's going to look like a black spot on the button. So that's what you kind of have to do. All right, so there it is. There it is mounted in the torso right here. They're all lighted, which is pretty good. The lighting is not too bad. <clears throat> like if you watch the uh, first season robot, you notice that they were, first of all, they weren't colored, they were all clear. But um, if, even if you watch it, you'll see that the center of the button always had, you could see the bulb outline. It was just a round sort of lighted dot in the center of the button. Didn't really light the entire button, so. This kind of falls a little bit like that because the um, LEDs that are inside the buttons that I bought, right, are in the center. So you still get most of the light in the center. So, but they're not bad. They look pretty good. And I'm satisfied with those. But the best part is they work. These are all functional buttons, which is great. Um, <clears throat> so they'll be able to do different functions, right? And that's pretty much it. But yeah, that's how it looks and it looks pretty good. And <clears throat> I'm glad I got this part, you know, finished. And it's really just using small two millimeter screws because that's all that fits in the frame here. And the main thing is to make sure that your opening behind this uh, finish plate is wide enough for the edges of the buttons because that's some of them were sticking and it was because they were hitting the edge of the actual torso itself in that opening and then the other thing um, is to you know create a plate that holds the buttons in the back as the support that is a certain distance away from the torso and I use those little again those little uh, standoff those little brass standoffs to make that distance and yeah, that's kind of what it work, looks like. And then if you look at it from the top here, you can see sort of how it kind of all looks, right? <clears throat> and it's just those two screws holding the whole thing in. Now I'm gonna wrap all the wiring in a bundle and run it up the side then, you know, and it'll connect through the top there like we were going to with everything else. But we've got two feed wires that feed all the lighting and then the, all the individual wires feed the actual push button closes and I did test them all out with a uh, continuity tester just to verify before I put this all in. So you want to make sure you test all your switches out. I actually missed one. I missed the, the uh, ground on one of them. It wasn't even lit. So there's all kinds of mistakes you can make when you're dealing with so many wires. So just check them all out before you do your final mounting and that's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed that video on the chest button installation and setup and one of the ways that you can do it. So as always, make sure you subscribe, hit that like button, put your comments down below about this video, and I'll see you on the next B9 Robot Build video. Peace, guys.